Good morning, everyone. Could I please have your attention? Hi. Listen up. Welcome to the second week of Digital Methods. Um, today's talk concerns Google, um, in particular search engine critique, but I'm going to come at search engine critique um, through a detour. And that detour is, is Google art. Um, and the title of the, of the talk is Aestheticizing Google Critique. So by aestheticizing is meant uh, to turn something into an object of desire or an object of, of interest. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is how artists um, take Google critique and aestheticize it. Turn Google critique, so take critiques of Google and turn them into, uh, into art projects. Um, so the art projects in some sense um, embody uh, critique. So this is, this is, this is how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss uh, Google. And when I talk about Google art, there are a few things um, that I want to start off with that I don't mean. So when I talk about Google art, I, I don't mean um, the Google art project. So if you were to type into Google, Google art, uh, the first result likely will be um, what Google refers to as its Google Cultural Institute. Um, and that is the art project, and it is uh, quite a project. Um, what Google has been doing, I think for approximately the last five years, or maybe even a little bit longer, um, is it has been um, digitizing uh, at very, very high resolution um, some of the great uh, artworks uh, of the world. Um, it, uh, it also has created a series of virtual tours um, through art institutions, um, and also it has um, allowed users to create their own galleries. So if you are um, into curation, um, this is an interesting online example thereof. Uh, so um, if you were to go to the Google Art Project and look at um, my galleries, you can create your own Sort of curated list of works on the basis of the of the ones um, that have been digitized and that are online. <coughs> You'll see the sample uh, Google Art curated projects are by uh, directors of leading art institutes, and then there are projects this this is done by uh, every the everyday people. Um, so this is the Google the Google Art Project or the Google Cultural Institute. So I'm not referring to that. The other thing that I'm not referring to when I talk about, about Google art is I'm not referring to the doodles. Um, now, the doodles um, have been something that have been around for quite a few years. Um, and they have uh, evolved um, from being um, quite simple and quite sporadic to being quite elaborate and uh, quite regular, quite routine. So Google Doodles were once merely static, and now they have evolved um, into animations, uh, even uh, little games. Um, what, it, what is interesting about um, the Google Doodles is they fall into a series of categories. Um, you could say they fall into two categories, sort of great achievements of humankind on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, um, sort of national days, national holidays. Um, and arguably, this is the, the Polish national day. Um, this is today, or is it yesterday? Yesterday. Um, <laughs> the Mexican <laughs> day of the dead. Uh, it was yesterday. Um, the, day after, the day after Halloween. Now, what's interesting, there have been papers, finally, that have come out um, analyzing Google's doodles. What's interesting, if you, if you think about the two categories of, of doodles, on the one hand, um, the great achievements of humankind, and on the other hand, uh, sort of national days, national holidays, 
Um, in some sense, these are the two kind of messages that Google would like to get across about its own project. One, Google, one of the greatest creations of humankind on the one hand, and on the other hand, that, that it's also nationally uh, relevant. So it's not uh, merely a universalizing machine, but it, it's also a series of national machines. And in some sense, this is a classic definition of globalization. Um, so globalization arguably um, is uh, the means by which a, a global uh, brand or a global company can make its way into national contexts and, and sell itself as, as being locally relevant or being local. Um, <clears throat> no, but what I'm referring to when I refer to Google Art um, is in fact projects which are not associated with Google um, and which are made by independent artists. Now, I want to start off by one uh, by uh, uh, Peter Parda from 2007. He's a Czech artist. And he um, was the first one to make a series of artworks <coughs> that commented on the doodle. So this is not a Google website. Um, this is a, a work of art uh, which uh, made a series of doodles uh, in some sense to comment on what Google does with its doodles. So in this particular sense, uh, it is argued, or the critique is, is that Google is, is being apolitical. So this is the Google doodle if it were one for HIV AIDS. Um, this is a Google Doodle if there were one for the crisis in Darfur, uh, in South uh, Sudan. Uh, this is the Google Doodle if there were one for the Asian tsunami or the Asian tsunamis and the victims. Um, now, there is an exception to this, um, the, the sort of apolitical Google, um, and it occurred in, in 2012 uh, when Google um, like a number of other tech companies, West Coast in particular, US-based tech companies, uh, were protesting uh, a particular act, um, the uh, uh, Stop Online Privacy Act, SOPA, as it was referred to, US uh, uh, legislative proposal, uh, where Google, possibly for the, the one and only time, sort of expressed a kind of political viewpoint uh, by blacking out its doodle or its, its logo, uh, logo and, and therefore being political. This was, um, I don't know if you recall this, Wikipedia also went black uh, for uh, a day um, in order to, uh, to protest that particular piece of legislation. Okay, so when talking about how artists aestheticize Google critique, uh, what I'd like to do is, is go into Google critique, uh, not just on how Google is um, a globalizing machine um, and uh, not just how Google uh, is uh, supposedly apolitical, uh, but rather um, some quite specific critiques that have emerged over the last decade or more. Um, and they concern, or I've, I've, I've carved them up or divided them up into four different types of critiques. Uh, the first type is, is what I call Google objects and subjects. So things that, that Google brings into being or people or user types which Google brings into being, Google objects and sub subjects. These are things like the dark web, ADD, uh, that's attention uh, deficit uh, disorder. I don't mean that literally, I mean that more figuratively. Uh, and a data body. Um, this being uh, a particular term um, which refers to the collection of data uh, on you or about you, uh, which in itself acts uh, in some sense. So that's the first category. The second category is Googleization. Googleization is a term that was coined by library, well, actually it was coined by sort of, um, tech journalists, uh, John Battelle, but but to use to taken up by, in particular, library scientists in the mid-2000s, uh, and there's quite a famous uh, book that was written, The Googleization of, of Everything. Um, Googleization uh, refers to how Google um, sounds a little bit like 
globalization, but it, in fact it refers to how Google takes over industry after industry with its particular business model, which is referred to as free. Uh, and it's a business model which, which gives a service in exchange for your data. Uh, and then with your data, um, uh, the company earns uh, money, largely through, through advertising. Um, Googleization, however, <coughs> was coined when Google sort of entered the hallow halls of the library um, with its Google Books project. And that, for some, was really was, drew the line. Um, and the, the librarians uh, and, and, and many others uh, started using this term um, to signify how, um, how sort of, you know, like Googling every industry or or Googleizing every industry might not be beneficial for, for humankind. So I'm going to talk about uh, what's referred to as front front end or front page Googleization, back end or back yeah, back end Googleization, um, etc. Google information politics. That's the third category. Um, this refers to a series of practices um, which which Google um, has. Uh, become embroiled in over the last sort of decade or so uh, concerning uh, censorship in particular, uh, the case in, in China, which, which I'll talk a little bit about, but also other kinds of um, uh, information politics which <coughs> refer largely to how Google um, orders websites, so which websites are privileged and which websites are not. Um, but also it refers to uh, whether or not uh, all websites uh, receive equal treatment by Google. Uh, and this is, this is, the, this is in, in fact a critique um, that, that comes up a lot. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the notion of spammy neighborhoods, which is this, a term that uh, uh, Matt Cutts, the Google blogger, introduced uh, some years ago. And finally, I'll talk about um, licensing. And it's interesting um, what it is that you agree to uh, when you type something into the search bar and, and click uh, search. Or, or the other sort of intriguing button, the I'm feeling lucky button, or, or in Dutch is you and hock. Um, whichever button you use, um, uh, or if it's just return, or if it's, if it's that one, you are, a, you are entering into a contract, if you will, uh, with Google. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how artists and others, different kinds of projects, um, have uh, comment on, commented on um, the kind of contract you're, you're, you're entering into. Okay, so Google objects and subjects um, uh, and how they've been aestheticized. I mean, the, the, the first one, um, and this isn't an artwork, the first one <coughs> is, um, is, is referred to as the deep web or the dark web. Um, and this is a term which was coined, I think somewhere in the late 90s, uh, and it was referred to in an article where, uh, there were two articles, one was published in Science, the other one was in Nature, where they found that search engines index only a relatively small portion of the entire web. So at the time, it was found that, that search engines index approximately 25% of the web, meaning that there's this other vast uh, web out there. Um, and sometimes it's depicted as an iceberg um, with, a, with a very, very sort of deep core uh, and then a sort of tip on the top, uh, over on the surface. That, that, that's the only part that you see. Um, but the dark web is also, or the term of the deep web, both of them, it, it kind of aestheticizes uh, Google or aestheticizes the web as well, or Google's web, if you will, uh, by... Um, associating uh, by creating this other other web, by creating this sort of dark, mysterious, deep, deep sea web, um, where all where all these other things are going on that we don't know about. Um, so it it could it could be quite a tawdry web. It's a it's a it's a web that's opaque. It's a web that um, that we can't uh, we can't see. Um, the other sort of object that's brought into being uh, by Google or by Google critique um, is the, is relatedly, is the sort of orphan website. The sad website that doesn't get links uh, and doesn't get indexed uh, 
uh, therefore by by Google. This is sort of the this is kind of the pitiful web, the web um, which which doesn't get traffic, which which doesn't have any comments in its uh, on its blogs or or doesn't get liked at all. You know, this this is the sort of this the sad web, if you will. Um, now Google uh, buries these sorts of sites, so to speak, um, by not returning them high up in in, in queries. Um, the second sort of um, web um, or sort of object that Google creates, arguably, um, is uh, attention deficit. Or, um, yeah, some people uh, refer to it as partial attention disorder, uh, whereby uh, because of the search engine and because the way in which we interact with the search engine, um, you uh, begin to have Sort of, you're you're not able to stay focused. Um, you type something in and you expect the results right away, and <coughs> Google advertises itself in its uh, right. Of the, the, it has a results page, but the other result you get is how quickly your query was answered. So it's this rapid fire return um, and this this uh, uh, idea that that what you want is what you get immediately, and this is also the case with increasingly with Google Instant, or with, with the voice-activated search, which starts with OK Google. Uh, this sort of idea that, that you, you, you get what, it is, what you want and right away um, um, has been discussed in, in a number of senses. Uh, in, a co in a cognitive sense, that, 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 we're become, that our attention span is, is decreasing. Um, uh, Nicholas Carr, the, uh, the well-known technology critic and cultural critic uh, talked about how um, uh, contemplative man is being replaced by flickering man. So this is this, this notion um, that we can't concentrate for, for a long period of time. We can't just read a book anymore. We need to go back to our machines and, and, and get updates of some sort, status updates, uh, etc. Now, one of the things um, that um, um, that has been studied over the last uh, so 10, 15 years is how users interact with uh, with search engines. So, the the earliest studies, 2002, 2003, uh, found that people were um, basically looking only at the first few results pages, um, and then increasingly over the years. Uh, people were looking at fewer and fewer results pages, and then ultimately, uh, most and then most recently, people were looking at fewer and fewer results, uh, and not leaving the first results page. So therefore, the real estate that is uh, the top of the page or the top of the Google results becomes extremely valuable. Now. Most recently, in the, in the latest study that I've read, and this came out of a marketing firm based in uh, Toronto, Canada, called Mediative. Uh, Mediative found uh, that people are now looking a, a bit farther down on the pages uh, of Google results. This has been a change. Uh, why is that, however? It's because the people are able to spot um, Google properties and skip them. So, you, so in your results, you'll see a, a Google News return or a Google Image return, etc. Um, and people now are able to scan pages uh, and find the top organic results, as they're called by the industry. Now, artworks that have commented on um, how Google either buries websites um, or um, doesn't take good care of orphan websites or on um, users um, being sort of turned into you know, folks with partial attention or, or, or attention, having attention disorders. I don't mean that, uh, again, uh, literally, I mean that figuratively. <coughs> Here's a project um, that was done by uh, uh, a couple of Dutch-based artists in, in collaboration with a group called De Geusen. Um, it's called Schmoogle. Um, Schmoogle um, was a project where you would type 
your query into, into Google, hit return, and it would randomize the results. Uh, so uh, result number 300 would be result number one, uh, etc. So it, it continually randomized the results. All right, so it has a commentary on, on, on the ranking practices uh, and on the bearing of, of, of sites. Um, okay, the third, this is a subject that's brought into being uh, by Google. Um, and that subject uh, has a number of different names. One of the earliest uh, names for this kind of phenomenon, the phenomenon of the, of the data double, is the data double. Um, the data double uh, was uh, used by a group called the Critical Art Ensemble, um, who uh, described the amount of data largely kept by uh, governments, but also by corporations uh, on you. So, so um, uh, turning you, so this was the critique of the 1960s, turning you into a number, um, or later um, turning you into a data construct, uh, which has uh, real world effects. Um, so your data body, for example, which, I mean, if you're going to fly um, to the US, for example, there's something on the order of 54 data points that precede you, so that arrive, so to speak, um, in, um, in, in, the, in the US uh, with the authorities uh, before you do. So this, in this data body has effects. Uh, you can be uh, profiled in particular ways, screened in other ways. Uh, so this is the idea of a, of a data body now, as, it re as it's referred to um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Google case or in search engines more generally, uh, this data body is considered to be a new one. It's, it's, it's that which is brought into being on the basis of your search history. Now, um, just to give you a sense of um, how, what a search history kind of looks like, I don't know if you've ever sort of managed how many people have managed their search history? Anyone? Okay. So we have a number of geeks in the room. That's interesting. Um, uh, this is an example um, which I write a lot about in the, in the digital methods book. Uh, the case of AOL, um, America Online, as it was once called, uh, and their search engine. Now, in 2006, they were the first company to release a series of search engine results. Uh, for the scientific community. So they released uh, engine results uh, uh, for a period of about, about six months um, for uh, hundreds of thousands of users. And they anonymized the results in the sense that each of the individual users' <coughs> search history was given a number. Um, so, so, and this is AOL user 311 uh, 045, um, which who um, who um, has an interesting series of queries. Um, so this person apparently owns a Scion car, um, is interested in, I don't know if that's tennis or golf, but then starts querying, how do I get revenge on an ex? How do I get revenge on an ex-girlfriend? How do I get revenge on a friend who effed you over? And then back to the replacement bumper of the car. <laughs> um, so what I mean, John Battelle refers to, or referred to Google um, in this particular sense as a database of intentions. So it's a database uh, which uh, in some sense uh, keeps uh, your intentions, your uh, thoughts, your actions, your, your life in some sense. I mean, this is almost, I mean, this is, not quite life blogging or quantified self, but th this is this is your search self, um, and this is the and this is the particular data body uh, amongst other ones, uh, arguably the, or the most famous one you could say that, that Google uh, brings into being. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to talk about a little bit about user seven one one three nine one. So this is a different one. This was three one one zero four five. Uh, but user 711391 uh, has been made into um, an artwork uh, by a couple of uh, Dutch um, um, artists, uh, video makers, who for um, Submarine, uh, which is a, which is a, which is a, a Dutch, um, uh, sort of what's 
or a digital storytelling company uh, for submarine created a, ser a, sort of a series of um, documentaries, sort of mini docs about user 711391. Um, and here um, you see how um, a particular user sort of converses with the search engine. So he uses the search engine as, as, a, as a, almost a sort of, uh, almost in conversation with it. Um, so they're not, they're not necessarily, I mean, they're all looking for, or, or she is looking for, for information, but it's, it's so much more than that. Um, so what I want to do is I'd like to show you um, part of the, uh, the, the documentary now um, so you have a sense of, of how uh, the data body uh, has been aestheticized. The data body is an object of uh, Google critique has been aestheticized. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's uh, I Love Alaska. It's a 13-part um, <coughs> documentary which chronicles the search history of, of that particular AOL user. Um, and as you can see, it provides a particularly intimate portrait of, 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 of an individual, the individual's concerns. Uh, and uh, Now, um, I want to move now to another project, uh, not an art project, but, but indeed uh, a project which uh, was made by um, kind of Google critics um, called Scroogle. Um, Scroogle uh, is one of the um, sort of many reactions to Google's um, sort of gathering of user data. Um, now, when you um, use Google, um, d there are two modes of use, so to speak. One's when you're logged in, and the other's when you're not logged in. So obviously the portrait um, that, that Google has of you when you're logged in is, is far more, let's call it accurate, um, than when you're not logged in. Um, uh, but when, even when you're not logged in, because of the, the cookies uh, that Google sets, um, there's still quite a lot of data that's collected on you. And what Scroogle um, did for, I think, something like nine years until it was uh, discontinued in 2012 um, because of something, because Google um, changed its, its advanced uh, query setting and Scroogle could no longer make use of Google. So Scroogle sat on top of Google and you would query it, um, but what you would get was um, uh, Google results without being tracked or without having any of your data collected. Um, and so um, it would, you would, uh, no cookie would be set on your machine. It also would not give you in its returns any Google properties. So no YouTube videos, uh, no Google images, no Google news, uh, no, so no Google properties uh, uh, what, whatsoever. Um, another project that is a reaction um, to um, Google's user data collection uh, activities uh, is a project by Helen Nissenbaum and Daniel Ho. Uh, Ho. Uh, Helen Nissenbaum is a professor at New York uh, University, quite well known in the, in the area of, uh, of uh, privacy uh, and, and law, information law. Um, and they created a project called Track Me Not. Um, and Track Me Not is an interesting uh, project um, and this is how they advertise it. Now, if you open your browser and you, and you uh, go into the preferences and you click the privacy uh, tab and you get the privacy panel, um, what, you, what you see um, is a, uh, and this is for, for all the various uh, browsers, what you see is a, uh, is a um, radio button which you can check, uh, which asks whether you would like to have have it be known that, that companies shouldn't track you. Um, and the commentary uh, is, um, they've, they've changed the wording, um, politely ask websites not, not to track me perhaps. The reason why they have changed the wording is because this is, if you click, if you check that box, it's completely voluntary <coughs> on the part of the, of the companies to follow your wishes, your desires. And this is the major debate that goes on constantly uh, societal debate. So should, should you have the opportunity to opt out? Or 
do you opt in by default and then industry voluntarily uh, uh, voluntarily um, can um, opt you out if you want to, if you want to not have your data collected. This is the big debate. Um, and so what Track Me Not uh, does um, is, it, is, it, is it practices the art of obfuscation. And so instead of sending uh, your query when you have this uh, Firefox extension uh, installed, what it does is it sends random text. Um, and so, so thereby sending sort of noise rather than signal uh, and thereby obfuscating uh, 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 your queries and, and thereby not allowing a sort of search engine history or search history to be built. Um, so those are, those are two projects, not artworks, uh, but, but projects that, that react quite specifically to the idea of a data body. Um, now, um, after Scroogle um, ended, uh, as I said, in, in 2012, there, there was quite a lot of question in, in, in the industry. I mean, this is an article from, from Search Engine Land. There are two major trade publications um, which follow the search engine industry. One is Search Engine Land, and the other one is um, Search Engine Watch. Um, this is an article from Search Engine Land. Um, and uh, the question was, well, what do we do now that, that school is no longer there? Um, so how do we, so we can install Track Me Not. Um, there are some other options. Um, the, the, the one sort of leading uh, um, pr you know, privacy-oriented search engine is of course DuckDuckGo, um, but arguably any of these other things are quite second, any of these other sort of solutions, or any of these other uh, al alternative search engines uh, in particular are, are uh, in some sense, they're, they're interesting, um, but they're, they're interesting if you want just information. But of course, Google is, is the major engine uh, by far. So to unplug yourself from, from, from the major engine, from, from Google itself um, and, and its results, um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's kind of like cutting the cord, as they say in TV studies, you no longer watch TV. I mean, it's, it's, it's removing yourself from the, main media, from the main new media source, if you will. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, this is how DuckDuckGo uh, advertises itself and has everything to do with what we were just talking about with not only the AOL user, um, but the rest of this is, uh, so you share your problems with your search engine, um, and then um, Google saves them and makes a profile out of your concerns. Um, and the, and the, the, the example here is herpes. Okay, I wanna talk about Googleization. Now this is the second sort of massive uh, critique of Google. Now, this is a different kind of critique. It's not about um, inclusion and exclusion, so which, which, which um, uh, sources rise to the top of the Google rankings and which, which are buried. And it's not about, um, well, it is in some sense a little bit about uh, personal data collection, but it's a, it's a much larger, it's a much, much larger critique. Um, and it started, I think, yeah, I mean, as I said, it started with the, as a reaction to the Google Books project, but then it started having a much larger <coughs> cultural resonance. Um, Google was was always the the don't be evil company, um, the kind of tech technocratic or, or tech company, um, which uh, had you know tech values, not not necessarily you know hardcore corporate ones or manipulative ones, or, um, and that image of Google arguably has, has, has uh, changed. Um, and I think it had to do with um, this Googleization critique, but, but I mean, also with a with growing uh, number of sort of different tropes. Um, this, this one, uh, this is a, uh, is a cartoon that was uh, uh, widely published. Um, with, with Google now um, looking a little less friendly and, and more like a sort of uh, kind of an octopus, um, uh, which which is which needs to be battled, um, and um, so where did this come from? So the Googleization, the term, as I said, was coined by John Battelle, two thousand three, um, and what he called a, 
uh, was a creeping dominance of Google over nearly all forms of uh, commerce, uh, commerce on the web. And it refers indeed to Google sort of moving in, away from just search, you know, web search, into other areas. Um, and those areas then become Googleized. Um, so Google News, for example, coincided coincided, didn't <laughs> cause, but coincided uh, with the decline of, of newspapers, uh, newspaper industry, um, with the amount of um, uh, ad revenue that newspapers uh, have received, which, is, which was always their main form of income, um, has dropped uh, substantially over the last uh, decade, largely due not to, to Google News, but to the rise of, of uh, web advertising more generally, and who's at the top of web advertising? Well, Google is. Um, so, so there's that industry, but there are many, many others. Um, and um, it's, it's it's sort of the internet, in particular, Google being being blamed for the for the decline or, or the death of all, all sorts of uh, old, old media forms, at least their business models. Um, now, uh, the other. What I would like to argue is, is that what Google, Googleization refers to is, in some sense, the end of new media uh, and the return of mass media, if you will, online. Um, so Googleization, in some sense, refers to Google as a, as a kind of mass media critique of Google. So Google becoming mass media. Um, and just to kick off that thought, um, when Wikipedia, for the first time a couple of years ago, um, and now it does it c continually, but for the first time asked its users to donate, one of the, one, the way it advertised itself was to say that it's a top, one of top four or five websites in the, in the world, um, and it um, has um, um, uh, servers that need to be uh, maintained, and, and etc. Uh, but we do this all, Wiki, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia speaking now, uh, with not as many servers as Google. Google might have as many as a million servers. Now, um, when you start thinking about uh, a company or, or, or an engine in particular with, with a million or, or probably far more um, servers, you're no longer in a kind of startup environment, right? Uh, you're, in, you're in a... You're, you're, you're talking about uh, you're talking about uh, some serious serious infrastructure. Uh, so so when when there's that level of infrastructure, um, um, the question is, uh, are is there ma should we talk about Google um, in terms of mass media, and then should we then regulate it like mass media, etc. Now I, what I want to talk to you about is what is mass media critique, um, and the extent to which in some sense, Google uh, fits uh, the model, if you will, of, of what mass media, what mass media are. Um, now, the first one, the first critique is, is that mass media have very, very large scale, very large scale production and distribution, um, and it wants to reach the largest possible audience. Uh, now, of course, this is particularly what Google uh, has. It is a massive infrastructure, and it's trying to reach the, the, the largest possible uh, audience. Um, it's also one way, interestingly enough. Um, so, so new media was always advertised as sort of interactive um, and thereby as sort of empowering. Um, but, uh, but with Google, you don't, really, you don't really talk back to Google. Um, um, so it's a one-way flow. The second mass media critique is that there's a strict separation uh, between uh, producers and distributors on the one hand and the receivers on the other hand. Um, so, so, so in this particular sense, um, Google, again, looks quite a lot uh, like, like mass media uh, in the sense that, it, that doesn't, it, there's no feedback mechanism, so to speak. Um, now, in that particular sense, there is also a um, asymmetrical power relationship between the between the engine and its users. Um, so, so the users 
um, apart from market share. So, so this is also very, very mass media like. So, 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 so the only kind of influence users have over the over the media um, is if they don't use it, if they walk away. Um, but otherwise, um, um, there's 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 in some sense no 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 recourse. Um, so the so the uh, relationship between the engine and its users is largely one way. The fourth mass media critique is that relations between senders and receivers are impersonal, anonymous, and commodified. Um, uh, now, why is that? Uh, well, users are normally, or viewers in the mass media sense, or readers, are, 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 are basically a, a market, a market segment. Um, and you are then, uh, when, when you view the content or read the content, you're also being marketed to for your particular demographic. Now, this is a little bit different with Google, because Google um, has changed in some sense, or has, has sought to change in some sense, the, the mass <coughs> media advertising model from, from, from broadcast advertising to what's called direct or personalized advertising. Advertising that's based more on individual uh, attributes, uh, desires, uh, etc., more based on your, your profile. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the, uh, the relationship that we have with our search engine could be easily described <coughs> as impersonal and commodified. Um, certainly not anonymous, however. Um, a lot is known about, about you, the user. Um, and then finally, the uh, last um, classic mass media critique, which, uh, <coughs> which one could ask whether it applies indeed to Google, um, is the tendency to standardize content. So, so in mass media, you tend to have content that appeals to the lowest common denominator, that appeals to the, to the masses. Now, this in some sense was the case until December 2009 when Google shifted its results from giving everyone the same results, universal results, to having results being personalized, and then personalized according to a number of things. Um, but certainly your geography uh, and your language, therefore. Um, so, so Google results are uh, increasingly um, tailored uh, uh, to you. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they still sort of enjoy um, broad appeal. So the amount of personalized results is relatively small. Um, and um, and, and uh, what Google returns to you are those results um, which are, in some sense, yeah, kind of mass media style results. So the results which are fresh, the results that users, many users have clicked on. Um, so, 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 sort of, you know, sort of content that's been voted up by, by users, as well as content that has received, received many links um, from other websites which themselves have received any link, many links. So those are traditionally the three most significant signals that, that Google has used to rank content, um, that has changed quite dramatically over the, over the last um, two or three years, uh, where there's been a series of updates to the, to the Google algorithms, um, which I'm going to talk about um, uh, after the break. 10 minutes. A little bit of time talking about uh, front page and back end uh, Googleization. So um, what's front page Googleization? It, it's interesting um, that Google's search bar is very, very clean, uh, aesthetically speaking. Uh, there's, as I said, there's, there's just that, that single uh, bar, and then there's two buttons. Uh, the I'm feeling lucky button being the, the, your intriguing second choice. Um, now the I feel I feel lucky I'm feeling lucky button is is um, just briefly um, is a bit of an anomaly uh, for Google because if you um, click the I'm feeling lucky you go directly to the top result, uh, thereby bypassing and sort of advertising opportunity. 
to bypassing the rule of results page. Um, and so, so, so that's, I mean, and it's, it, and it's relatively little used anyway. But I just want to point that out, that, that, um, um, that, that the I'm feeling lucky button is, is a little bit of an anomaly uh, in terms of its business model. But nevertheless, um, the front page is very, very clean. Um, above the search bar were once tabs, which, which have now moved since uh, 2009, I think, which have now moved upper left. Um, and the, and, and so, this, so the search remains extremely minimal. Um, and, it, and it's this sort of minimalism um, that other uh, products or other uh, uh, companies would like to emulate, you know, having just this very clean, very sort of streamlined, very simple. But of course, that simplicity belies the, com belies the complexity, which is behind the engine, um, and belies the fact um, that it is not just a pure algorithmic uh, brilliance, uh, but um, that there are also you know, a lot of a lot of messiness uh, behind that <laughs> simple search bar. Um, this is a this is a um, a kind of cartoon. It sort of summarizes, in some sense, um, this sort of very very simple idea of um, that that so many applications um, uh, have you know a bunch of fields, a lot of complexity, and 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 products. That, that are made are oftentimes compared to Google. So how clean is it? How, how simplified is it? Um, now on the back end, um, there have been sort of artistic responses um, to, to, Google's, to Google's back end. Um, so on the, on the front end, you have this, this, this simplicity and this, this assumption of kind of the, the pure algorithm and then and the uh, outputting these sort of organic results uh, as if by, by magic or certainly, certainly doing so brilliantly, <coughs> scientifically. Um, but on the back end, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. And indeed, there have been a number of artworks which have tried to explore um, and then critique um, Google's, in some sense, of their, how, how Google, in fact, makes money. <laughs> And the most well-known of which I would say is by Uber Morgan, um, which um, is a, from Italian artists, Italian, Austro, Italian, I think Italian artists, uh, Uber <coughs> Morgan. And the famous project um, is called Google Will Eat Itself. Um, and this is something um, which was quite brilliant in its, in its day. So what Uber Morgan did was they set up a series of, um, um, of pages um, um, uh, took out ads um, and had robots go to all of these ads. And all the ad <coughs> revenue that was made, they would receive as uh, checks in the mail. And then they would take that money and they would buy Google shares. So this idea that over time, eventually, um, Google um, would, would, in fact, eat, it, eat itself. Now, it, it, um, uh, I mean, they, they didn't generate all that much uh, revenue, ultimately, uh, but the concept was a, was a strong one. And this particular project, Google Will Eat Itself, um, was one uh, in a trilogy of projects that looked at, in some sense, the mass mediatization of, of new media or looked at you know, the, the large companies um, and, co and, and created commentaries on them. Um, this, the, one of the other ones was called Amazon Noir, and what Amazon Noir uh, did was um, stitch together um, all of the previews of, of a number of books that were sold on Amazon to, to in fact kit together or stitch together the entire book um, and then sort of and then to make it available on the noir, on the black market. Um, this was another project, again, um, look at, you know, exploring the back end and, and, the, and, the, and the business models. That was of Amazon. And, and then the other one, which was um, um, quite amusing, was called Face to Facebook, which used um, image re uh, recognition software 
uh, of profile pictures uh, in order to create automatic uh, matches, it's sort of like a kind of automated uh, sort of dating service. <coughs> okay, I want to now move to uh, the third type of critique that's made of, of Google generally, and that's information politics. Uh, what you see before you are um, two queries uh, for the same term, uh, Tiananmen. Um, one of the queries is done in Google Image Search, and the other query, Google Image Search, that's the .com version. The other one is done in, the, in, the, in Google uh, China at the time. Um, and you see two very, very different sets of results. Um, and this this side by side comparison um, was made available uh, by the by the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Um, they were the first ones to make this sort of side by side comparison of the of the engine results from Google.com and, and Google.cn. Um, and you see the query for Tiananmen, which to a lot of people refers to the uprising in 1991 um, in the square. Um, in, uh, in Beijing, um, but the Google China version sort of takes out the, those protests, those, those, those tank pictures, the, the iconic tank pictures, and it says just replaces them with the sort of the, 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 the Tiananmen Square, which is for tourists. So kind of cleaning, uh, cleaning the, the historical record, if you will, um, and engaging um, in, a, in classic information <laughs> politics. So classic information politics refers to uh, removing certain un unpalatable information um, uh, for ideological, political, uh, or other purposes. Um, there have been a series of, of responses um, to uh, censorship. This is, a, this is an art project um, which, um, uh, in fact, Eric Bohr also participated in. Uh, it's called the misspelling generator, so the idea here um, is that you can get sensitive information past the censors if you misspell the words. Um, and, and this is a kind of <coughs> classic technique of, of censorship circumvention. Um, the other technique, which was, which, was, which was really interesting, which was used also with Google China, um, was to uh, embed political information in ads. Um, so ads would appear on search engine result pages for Tiananmen, right? So the Tiananmen results were cleaned. However, the ad that popped up had had sort of political or historical uh, content in it. Um, yeah, the second um, sort of form of information politics I would like to talk about is a little bit more subtle, um, and it refers to how Google uh, treats individual websites and whether or not all websites are being treated equally. So um, uh, you would think that on the web, if you're, if you're following a sort of, in some sense, a kind of pure page rank algorithm, um, that all links would count, would count the same. So the more links you would receive uh, from websites that themselves uh, are, have a large quantity of links to them would, would raise your uh, website in the rankings. However, um, what has happened over the last number of years is there's been a, a large development um, in um, sort of link fodder or link <coughs> spam. Um, and certain websites are created um, which um, are created solely for the purposes of, of granting large quantities of links to particular sites, thereby boosting uh, these sites in the, in the, uh, in the uh, sense of, of page rank or in the eyes of the, of the uh, algorithm. So what has, has happened is that Google started um, um, to not have all links being treated equally. So they did that in at least two senses. The first one was in the comment space uh, with the introduction of the no follow tag. So in the comment space, there's, a, a, there's a quite a lot of spam there. Uh, but there's a, a, also quite a lot of valuable comments. Um, Google, uh, amongst other engines, stopped uh, indexing comments, basically, and all the links in it uh, that had a no-follow attribute. And, and they actually pushed uh, websites to uh, implement that, that attribute in the comment space, uh, so not to, uh, uh, so those links don't count. Secondly, 
um, they started to identify what was referred to quite beautifully as spammy neighborhoods. These are sort of like the bad areas of the web um, where you might not want to go. And in those bad neighborhoods or spammy neighborhoods, there's a lot of this sort of illicit act or illicit, this sort of undesirable activity going on with a lot of backdoor pages, a lot of black hat SEO practices, uh, search engine optimization practices. Um, and what Google started doing was they started not giving these links as much weight um, that came from spammy neighborhoods. Um, and you saw this in particular with some of the major algorithmic updates of the past four years or so. And, and I think the, the one um, that is, was most talked about, and probably still is, um, as having the ma most major impact on sort of websites from bad neighborhoods um, was, was the, was the so-called Panda update. Um, and this one um, uh, was advertised as improving the rankings for a, a large number of quality websites. But what in fact it did was it devalued a lot of websites which were considered to be uh, spammy. Now, um, now, this is in information politics, this, is, this, is a, this of course is a very controversial thing to do. Because um, what what is what one person spam is another person's high quality website. Um, so, for example, um, conspiracy websites took a heavy hit. Websites that aggregate content from other websites also took heavy hits, so were were demoted. Um, and a lot of a lot of websites uh, which noticed that they had been demoted <coughs> or devalued um, also went out of business or their their business model uh, um, was. Um, was affected. Um, one of the major, arguably, uh, and this is a sort of this is the kind of the, the, the new kind of sweatshop labor, online sweatshops um, that is talked about in the new digital economy. Um, one of the major companies, which uh, was also took a quite a heavy hit, uh, was quote unquote the called uh, demand media. And demand media, there was a famous article that was written up in Wired a few years ago. Um, which um, which sort of opened the, the uh, opened the veil un un unveiled the practices of demand media, which is a company um, which if you for example type in um, how to um, not that you would, but apparently a lot of people do how to pack for a trip to Rome. Now what demand media does or claims to do is they reverse engineer a query history, so they reverse engineer popular queries, how to pack your bags or your suitcase for a trip to Rome. Apparently that's a popular query. And then what they do is they, is they, they hire people to make a movie um, packing a bag. So, so you know what, what kind of clothes should you bring? Like a two minute movie, that, which then they put up on YouTube, um, which because this query is so popular and on the other hand, because they know what the exact query it is and they optimize um, their video or their content for that query, it comes up on the top. Um, so demand media um, was you know, paying people very, very little money to make these extremely low quality videos, um, which would then rise to the top of engine returns. Um, so this was, the, this was the sort of the new digital economy, the new, the new content uh, creation uh, uh, online, um, which, um, which, uh, which was being severely critiqued uh, nevertheless, and also which then Panda and subsequent uh, algorithmic updates from Google uh, ultimately um, uh, sort of you know, lowered lowered them back down in the in their <coughs> rankings. Uh, this is a recent series of artworks um, uh, by uh, Paolo uh, uh, Sirio, um, uh, I think Italian uh, artist based in New York City, who. Um, took Google Street View <coughs> and um, uh, created the, this artwork called Street Ghosts. Um, these are a series of Google um, Street View images which he then um, sort of recreated, um, printed out, um, and, and then glued them using weak glue in the same spot 
uh, on the street as where these images were taken. So, so you see, um, this is the uh, Google Street View, um, and and this is his uh, reproduction of it. And 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 th the point here um, uh, also is one about um, a series. There's a series of points. So the, the, there's, of course, the, the privacy aspect and the, and the great debate about um, Google um, um, taking these sort of unauthorized uh, photographs and not having people's permission to, um, to, to photograph them. And this debate is, is one that is, is uh, sort of raging in, in, in Germany, um, I would say the most, Canada probably a little bit as well, um, not so much in, in other countries. Um, so these are these are some of them, and this is I think the one of the more famous. Uh, okay, the last one that I want to talk about um, is licensing. Now, um, <clears throat> there are a series of kind of tech licenses uh, which you may or may not be aware of. Um, uh, the first one is called shrink wrap. So um, if you were to buy, I don't know who still does this. Um, a uh, DVD or a, <laughs> a CD, or, but still, uh, some consumer electronics have this, and it's it, and it's wrapped in plastic, um, and there's a there's kind of a holog holographic seal on it. So the minute you break that plastic, uh, that in, and that shrink wrap, <laughs> you agree to a series of things. Um, the second one is called uh, click wrap, um, and this is the, uh, the, the sort of I agree buttons. Uh, so you either check them or you, or you actually do click on these buttons. These are refers to as click wrap, and the, and, the, and the wrap comes from this shrink wrap idea. And then the, the final one um, is called browse wrap. So by browsing, just browsing, you agree. Um, so you're not explicitly agreeing, uh, but, but through your browsing, so these have been the source of a uh, series of artworks. This is uh, one that's done by uh, colleagues. Uh, it's called the Whatever Button. Um, it, was, uh, it, was a it was a classic for a while when I was out there. So, so the Whatever, whatever Button uh, would replace the I Agree button. It's a Firefox uh, sort of add-on. It would, it would uh, um, uh, replace the I Agree button. And this, in some sense, expresses the, the the user behavior, uh, so, so you don't read the you don't read the license. Um, you you uh, you just basically say whatever, um, and it and it relates also to the futility of trying, in some <coughs> sense, um, to to I don't know resist or 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 not um, not have your cookies turned on or not. So so, so in order to participate in um, the you know the digital society one needs these pieces of software uh, no matter what uh, and they're they're quite difficult to tweak as well um, so this is this is this is the whatever button in action um, now what you uh, may or may not know is what you're agreeing to when you search Google um, and. You agree to largely, I mean, you agree to a bunch of things, and you just look at it because it's quite fascinating to see. I mean, there's a series of article after article after article after article of what you're agreeing to. Um, but you're, but for all intents and purposes, uh, as far as our work is concerned, you're agreeing to three things. Um, the first thing is that you agree to only search Google through the search bar. It might sound trivial, but um, but this week you'll notice that it's not trivial. Uh, but anyway, you first you agree to only search Google through the search bar. The second thing um, is that you agree not to um, uh, 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 save the results. That sounds like why wouldn't you be able to save the results? But anyway, you agree not to. Um, and the third one is you also agree not to create a derivative work <coughs> from the results. Now. 
there have been a series of art projects and other software projects um, which have broken these terms of service quite spectacularly. Uh, and the first one um, is this one, it's Newsmap. Um, this won a major award at Ars Electronica um, in, uh, in Linz a few years ago. Um, and it, was, it sat on top of Google News um, and it created a sort of tree map out of Google News um, showing which, which uh, news stories are resonating the most across uh, Google News. So it, it, it in some sense shows you um, a, kind of, a, a kind of intention economy of news. And this is these are these are saving. I don't. Uh, I guess this 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 probably doesn't search through the search bar, uh, or or it probably it probably batch queries Google News. It it saves the results because it has to put it into a database and it creates a derivative work from the results. So it breaks the three terms. Um, this is another one. Um, this is a, a piece of uh, work that we did. It's sort of more analytical <coughs> work. Um, showing, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a, in a, in a little bit, but showing um, um, the different images you receive for queries using different terms, but for the same thing. Um, so we put these images side by side um, to show the different kinds of uh, looks, if you will, that you get uh, of the barrier between um, Israel and the, and the occupied Palestinian territories which is referred to by the Palestinians as, a, uh, as the apartheid wall, and it's referred to by the Israelis as the security fence. It's two very, very different ways of thinking about what that object is. But also when you query it, you see two very, very different sets of depictions of what that object is. And I'll come back to this uh, later. This is another art project by de Kherzen. I mentioned them previously, this Dutch art group, where they um, put Google images, uh, local domain Google images side by side. This is for the query uh, violence, um, and they show the different sorts of images and the different kinds of concerns, the different kinds of societal concerns um, that are expressed through the top images for queries of uh, violence uh, <coughs> in four different, uh, four different engines. Um, this is another piece that we did um, this is a query for RFID, uh, which, is, which refers to radio frequency identification uh, tags, RFID. And RFID, um, uh, for some, is quite scary, because it's about, uh, uh, and for others, it's, it's, really, it's only about logistics and, and, and the tags that go on your, your luggage. Um, but for others, um, it portends a future when you yourselves are tagged or when tags are embedded in your skin and you yourselves can be tracked. Um, and so we looked at the top 100 image results for the query RFID and we categorized them as either wet or dry, either dry dealing with pure logistics or wet dealing with humans. And you see that most of the images that come out of Google are of the dry variety, meaning that there has a, kind of, a particular kind of politics of, of images built in and the very few wet ones you see here, and you also see where, they're, where they are ranked. What I have <coughs> done um, today is talked about uh, Google, Google critique, um, and talked, in fact, about um, four, four kinds. Um, the first one is, is the kinds of objects and subjects uh, which are brought into being by Google, objects and subjects. Um, and how they are, in some sense, commented upon by artists. Uh, now, the dark web um, is one that there aren't too many artworks or decent artworks, but many of the other ones, um, the fact that Google is changing our attention span, that, we, uh, that Google is, is burying certain results, privileging other results, and what kind of results are being privileged, these are the sources of, uh, of, of uh, these, these, these critiques of Google are the sources of, of artworks. Um, I've also talked about Googleization, which came from the library scientists um, and the librarians, the term uh, which refers to Google um, moving into industry after industry uh, with its business model of free and threatening that, that, that industry, largely old media ones. Um, talked about Google information politics. Um, and a series of projects that 
reflect on either Google's uh, history of censorship or Google's um, not treating all sites the same or creating so-called spammy neighborhoods, dividing the web up into uh, uh, nice neighborhoods and not so nice ones. Um, and also talked a little bit about um, uh, licensing and what you agree to when you when you agree when you when you search Google and, and what kind of uh, artworks have been made in response um, to those critiques of Google licensing. Thanks very much. See you next time.